Okay, so today we'll be co covering some common concurrency problems. We'll firstly quickly revise uh, some of the problems we did last time. We just started off with producer-consumer problems using semaphores, and we added mutual exclusion because we figured out that one of the existing solution, one of the previous solutions, didn't have mutual exclusion. So we added sem weight and sem pose in these lines. But what was the issue? Deadlock. Not, yeah. So it was a deadlock situation because we were calling the lock and unlock fairly early. We should have the correct solution will only call lock and unlock before put. And you should always remember this pictorial representation of deadlock. So you'll ensure this will ensure that you never get confused. If we want to very quickly revise why the deadlock would occur. Let's say the consumer required the view text, line C0. This is the consumer, this is the producer. Consumer calls wait on the full semaphore. Initially, what is full? Uh, number of, full was the number of full slots, right? So it was zero initially. Empty is the number of empty slots, which is N initially. So full is zero. The consumer will thus be blocked on the weight. The consumer will still hold the mutex. The producer now, the corresponding post will only happen uh, from the producer. And this is the producer code where the producer puts something on the buffer and it posts. But this won't execute because we are holding the mutex at this point of time. Until unless this mutex is released, we can't do anything about it. And the correct solution involves having the mutex uh, lock and unlock just before put and get. We started off, also started the discussion with dining philosophers problem. And one of the point which you were asking me is now a question in your assignment. So I'll leave it up to you too. If, if you've seen the assignment, so you were discussing, right, that we can lock, you can put a lock, starting lock and unlock it. So this is one of the questions in the assignment to figure out why is that bad. And I've given you two hypothetical situations to help you understand how to solve this problem. <coughs> so in the classic setting, we just write weight on left and right and put on left and right. There is a there is a deadlock when each of them have picked up the first fork, but none of them have been able to pick up the last fork. The simple solution was to break this cycle or the cyclical dependency. And we just, for one of the philosophers, we just swap the order. You first pick up the right, then you pick up the left. For example, now if all of them have picked up their left folks from P0 to P3, now P4 first has to pick up the right one, which is F0, which has been occupied by P0. So P4 won't be able to uh, acquire the left fork also. So there will be no deadlock. Eventually, some of them will release the resources, one of the resources, and one of them will be able to. For example, F4 would be the, sorry, P3 probably would be the first philosopher to be able to get access to both of these forks. It will complete, and then eventually they'll all. Okay, a quick primer on condition variables again, quick revision, because in the next slide, we'll be developing or we'll be writing implementation to create semaphores using condition variables. So currently we've been using uh, semaphores to build condition variables. Now we have to do the reverse task. To use mutex and, and condition variables to create a semaphore. So in terms of the condition variables, we have two primitives, weight and signal. Weight assumes that the lock is held when weight, weight has been called, puts the call out of the comically releases the lock and requires the lock before returning. And signal will wait a single waiting thread if any. And if there's no waiting thread, it just returns. Okay. So there are four important things I want you to do. You were trying to build a lock, sorry, semaphore using lock and condition variables. Any critical section should require locking. That's I think expected at this point of time. Signal and waiting on condition. So semaphores also have this notion of waiting and posting, right? So we'd be using conditional wait and conditional signal to achieve that effect. 
there is one important difference. So in semaphores, we could re uh, reduce the value. We could keep on reducing the value, right? Because we would just we just reduce one value and then we go to sleep. And the number, the negative value, would indicate the number of sleeping thread, right? Of the semaphore. But in this case, we are not maintaining that invariance, and we said that the uh, so we don't go below a certain number of values. We don't go below zero in some sense. That's one of the tricks involved in this implementation. If we can go below a certain negative number, it becomes more complicated and involved. So we'll look at that in a couple of minutes when we start <coughs> when we actually look at the code. Okay, so take a minute. If you have to, if you have to in, uh, initialize a semaphore, how would you do that in your implementation using locks and condition variables? What all, what all do you need to initialize? Does everyone get the question? So the API usage is you hash include semaphore.h. Correspondingly, you'll have to include something else here for locks and for condition variables. You're initializing semaphore s. But we said that we want to build a semaphore using locks and condition variables. So what do we need to initialize? Lock and condition variable. Take a minute and write this. Okay, does this make sense? We define a structure. Now, this R semaphore is called semaphore. Uh, we have a value. We have we initialize the condition variable. We initialize the oh, sorry, define the condition variable and the lock. And that's the name. Does this make sense? We're not using it at this point of time. But in the next one. Okay, initializing the value of the semaphore. How will we initialize? R semaphore or semaphore? So let's go back to the previous slide and see. Okay, so take the structure and now maybe just write this down in your notebook so that we don't have to. I don't have to go back to this slide again and again. So it has a value. It has a condition and a lock. Condition variable and a lock. Initialize R semaphore now. A 
I think what most of you would have done is to initialize the value. S value is value. But did all of you initialize the condition variable and the mutex? <coughs> or missed it? How many missed it? <coughs> of course, that's so when you program it, it's easier. You won't forget to, to initialize these things. But it's a matter of good convention and practice. Okay, now the tricky part. How will you implement SAM and the using condition variables? And do remember this, this condition that we said that we don't want to maintain the invariant that the value of SAM of the negative reflects the number of waiting sites. That is a fairly complicated implementation. But can we add one and say the positive value? Sorry. <coughs> Can we add one and say the positive value of value is the number of waiting sites? Uh, I didn't get it. Can we add a value? Negative like value minus one, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever negative. Yeah. Can we do plus and take a positive? Or you number? can, or you can change the do while to a while. So currently, this is somewhat, in the sense, two words. Do so and while something. Change the do while to while so that the value doesn't become. So one of the hints is that we, so if we don't want the value to become negative, we first check the condition if it's negative or not. If it's negative, then we then we sleep, right? Or wait. And if it's not negative, that means it doesn't then then it doesn't go into that while loop, it comes out of it, we can decrement the value. Has anyone solved it? Okay, I'll show the definitions of weight and condition again in case. You can also take a snap of this slide if you want to. We only want to do weight and uh, semaphore, weight and semaphore post. But in case you don't remember, <coughs> in case you don't remember the definition, you can take a snap.
don't worry about getting it 100% correct, but write something. So there has to be one line on decrementing the value of S. So at least that line, that line all of you should be able to. This whole thing is an atomic operation. So if there's an atomic operation, what other things you need to add? Lock. So if you didn't add a lock, please do add that also. Okay, so here's the solution. Look at it for a couple of minutes and see if you understand it or not. There's a lock and an unlock. That's fairly easy to understand. That's because of the requirement of atomicity. There's a decrement by one, which is again fairly easy to understand. The only thing <coughs> is the, so this is in some sense a do while loop. You do something while you check the condition holds or not. But for this particular case, we said that the value can never go below uh, zero. We don't want to, we don't want the value to go below, sorry, will it go below zero or? It won't go below minus one. Is that true? So if the value was minus one, it does a conditional case. If the value was okay, even value of zero. So the value is zero. If the value is zero, it goes into a conditional rate and then it decrements by so so that when the value is zero we will wait. Right. And the only time when we'll be woken up is when uh, somebody else gives a signal. Right, and, and then the value would be incrementing there by one. Right, and then the value would be incremented by one. So, and after we've been woken up, we can decrease the value again. So we'll never go below zero. So in case of multiple, right? If there are multiple consumers, uh, let's say there is one one thread waiting, one thread called then wait. Uh, the value of S was initially zero, so it waits at this point of time. So another thread will call it and still wait. All of them will keep on waiting. Till the time the value has been incremented by one, uh, by one sem post or whatever the zen post. Does that make sense? Or is it still confused? When it will go in waiting state, uh -huh. it, it has the lock, right? It has the lock. So it, uh, someone will signal that you have to wake up. And for that, uh, someone has to put the value in the buffer. Uh, uh, and sorry, it goes the lock. So while sleeping, what happens? Uh, but when it is sleeping, yeah. so someone will put the value and then signal, uh, then it will get open up, right? So what was the definition of? <laughs> Wait. What is the quality of sleep anatomically related to the lock? So the lock will be released at that time, right? I know this is fairly confusing, but I don't see any way around it. So we have to remember these definitions again and again. That's why I'm trying to put them each time. Yes, then equal to zero can be. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Why can't you just put the like one to one wording of how it is given there? Uh, if you just put one to one wording. Like while 
So if we just the first question, if we just put s value minus minus, so we'll be decrementing the values to a certain minus n, right? It can go to the minus n. Uh, I don't know at this point in time, but but there is some reason why they why they recommend that it's, it's becomes fairly complicated. I've not figured that out at, at this point of time. Okay, sorry, your question is. Sorry. Yeah. So if never works, right? We always have to use a while. Yeah, why is it equal to? So equal to because like we are doing minus one. So after that we are checking it like it, it would have been zero at the start mm -hmm. and then we did a minus one. Then it's checking that it's less than zero. Right. Here like we are not doing the minus before. Mm -hmm. That's why we have to see it. Right, like, so in, in some sense what he's saying is also what my understanding was. So if you convert from a do y to a y, so we have to change the condition slightly. So that's what is happening. So whatever was being done is being checked in a slightly different fashion. Any other question in this? Okay, the opposite of it, send post, <coughs> or we implement that. This is easier. So this is also an atomic operation. So we have a mutex lock and unlock. We increment the value and we do a series. This one is really like, trivial to just do the one to one mapping. Previous one is still tricky. So I'll probably read up more again and we can discuss it in the next class again. <coughs> so when you wake up a signal, mm -hmm. doesn't that automatically automatically acquire the lock? When you wake when we wake up, when a waiting signal is woken up by like this, right? Won't it automatically acquire the lock? That is why we have an unlock. That will that will acquire the lock, right? Uh, as assuming inbuilt a signal will unlock it. So, should I have different locks for entering the atomicity and the lock which we actually require? So, uh, so for Aditya's question, the signal will become old to the ready state and wait for the lock to get acquired. No, it's an automatically by both of them, it is a power number. It gets into the ready state and you wait for the operator. So it's a different state. But it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. It acquires the lock. It waits for the lock to get released and then it points it, then it moves forward. Okay, either way, we will discuss it next time. I will read up more and I will ensure that there is somewhat more clarity. Sorry, your question was? So there is only a single lock. I mean, so the lock is there only for a time. So, so in general, for condition variables also, that lock is used for atomicity only. So if we go back on the slides and we see that, so where we were using it for join. So again, the purpose was for atomicity only. So the, this particular lock, which we pass in the condition variable. So we always pass the same lock as we are using for a comic.
Okay, very quick discussion on reader's writer's block. I'm not discussing the implementation of the solution, but just discussing the philosophy. So there are a number of congruent list operations like inserts and lookups. Uh, does lookup require lock? If there is only threads looking up or reading, do we require a lock? No, right? We require only a lock when something is being modified. So the basic idea is, let's say there are a lot more number of readers. So all the readers can together read the data structure concurrently. So they can read at different nodes, they can read the same node again and again. But only when there is some writer, then we need to hold the thread. So we need to have somewhat different locks for readers and writers. The, the first thing we require is that what kind of processes are there? Are there multiple readers or there is a single writer? So that's the contention. Multiple readers can read at the same time, but uh, only single writer can write at the same at, at one given point of time. So insert is going to change the state of the list, and we require a traditional critical section. So we require a lock and a lock. So reading the list structure does not require any modification, and the only thing we need to ensure is that there is some kind of a, only one of them is going to be executed. Multiple readers or a single writer. So that's another important problem that, that has been uh, studied. Okay, so now about concurrency bugs. In this image, can you spot the murderer? Spot the murderer. Someone killed someone in this image. That killed the machine. Who? Which machine? There are multiple of these. Yeah, I don't know the exact one, but uh, this is. Let me show you the video. Look at kind of an extreme example of timing dependent input being difficult to deal with. So in the 1980s, there's a machine called a Therac 25. And what the Therac 25 was, was a radiation therapy machine. And it was used to deliver a highly concentrated beam of radiation to a part of a human body where that beam can be used to destroy cancerous tissue without harming tissue that's nearby. And as you can see, this is not obviously an inherently safe technology. It's going to depend on skilled operators and also highly safe software in order to safely dose patients at the cancer site without harming the patients. So what happened with the Therac 25 was a tragic series of mistakes where six people were subjected to massive radiation overdoses, and several of these people died. And I'll make sure to include a link about these occurrences in the supplementary material for this course. And if you actually take a look at that, you'll find that it's really quite terrifying reading. It's really um, a very scary series of accidents. The Therac 25 had a number of serious issues with its software, and we're just going to talk about one of them here. So the Therac 25 was a largely software-controlled device, and it had, at the time, a fairly sophisticated controller, and it turned out that the people developing the software put a number of bugs into it. The particular bug that I'm talking about here was a software bug called a race condition. And what a race condition is, is a scenario where different threads of execution fail to be properly synchronized, with the result being that the software containing the race conditions can actually make mistakes. So this particular race condition in the Therac 25 software involved the keyboard input to the radiation therapy machine, which is what the person operating the machine used to tell the machine how to treat the patient. And what happened was, if the operator of the machine typed slowly, the bug was very unlikely to be triggered. And of course, while the machine was being tested, the people testing the machine weren't very good at using it, they hadn't used it a lot, and so they didn't type very fast. But unfortunately, as operators in hospitals became more and more familiar with this machine, as they treated hundreds and hundreds of patients, what happened was, these people got very good at operating the machine, they typed faster and faster, and eventually they started triggering this bug. And the effect of this bug, unfortunately, was to deliver massive radiation overdoses to patients, and as I said, this led to several fatalities. And so the kind of quandary that this, this scenario raises for us as software testers is, do we have to care about the time at which inputs arrive at our software under test, or can we not worry about that? And so obviously, for the Therac 25, and obviously also for something like a Linux kernel, the time at which inputs arrive is relevant. On the other hand, unless we've been extremely sloppy, the square root function that we've been talking about won't care about the time at which its input, inputs arrive. So 
So I hope you could appreciate that writing concurrent programs is hard and there are lives at stake. That is why I never write concurrent programs. Although I'm teaching, but you do require them in an operating systems course. And all the operating system data structures are in fact thread based. So this is a study of 500,000 bug reports. This is a very nice paper, so you should, you can just refer the textbook to find out the name of the paper. You should definitely read it, it's fairly readable. So, so and it's, it's an example of how to write good papers on, on systems. So it's talking about different types of bugs in four major projects, and majority of them, so the highest number of bugs are usually atomicity. So you would expect that atomicity is fairly easy to guess right. But when you have such large code bases, multiple people contributing, very complex workflows, even something basic as atomicity can have issues. Deadlock is, of course, it's, it's fairly, it can be fairly non trivial at times to understand how deadlock can work. Okay, so let's spend a time, spend a minute. There are two threads in this MySQL bug. Uh, can you find out the bug in this? And the title should uh, title of the slide should tell you the kind of the bug. There is. Sahit, what's the bug? So you, you want to, sorry, yeah, be good. Okay, so initially let's say, what was the value in this? Some value, non-value, okay, then? There's a context switch, value becomes null. At this point of time, there's again a context switch, what do you write in this, in this file? So there will be a null pointer. And how would you solve this? Side? No. Yeah. Where do you add a lock? I'm sure we would have forgotten to initialize whenever we, we add a lock before these things are and similarly in thread before these values are being used. Yes. Take a topic. Which one? The third line. Uh, so there are multiple threads which can access the same. Okay, you're saying that why do you even require a lock? Okay. Okay, in this case there is an order violation problem. Can anyone figure out what that is? So order violation is when we expect A to execute before B. Something on that lines. Someone else. Smith. <coughs> so I've told you the answer. We expect one thread to execute before the other. Which one do we expect to execute before the other? <coughs> thread one. And why is that? Because it's initializing this variable. In thread 2, it's accessing that variable. So you always need to initialize it before you want to access it. How do you ensure that this uh, this is the result? How do you do order? So in thread, it's p thread underscore join. That's the POSIX, POSIX world. Otherwise, you could use condition variables, which is fairly complicated, or you could also use seven modes. Ensure there is some order. In this particular solution, it was a condition variables based solution. So it's a complicated part, but I used some codes. Okay, the deadlock bug. Can everyone see why there could be deadlock in this? Shivji, can you see why there's a headlock in this? Okay. 
okay tell me one order in which there will be no deadlock and assume that there will be some unlock after this Yeah. So thread one executes acquires lock one. Then the context is thread two executes acquires lock l two. Now thread one wants if there is a context switch back, it wants to acquire l two. But who is acquiring l two? Thread two. And thread two if there is a context switch, so thread two wants to acquire l one, but who is holding lock l one? Thread one. So that's a classic thread lock. So I also discussed in the previous slide uh, version. Of it, which works. So if thread one gets lock L one, there's no context switch. It gets lock L two. It then completes the critical section, unlocks both the threads. After that, there is a context switch. Thread two gets L two. It gets L one. So that's a perfect order. There is no problem in that. But if there are context switch in between, that's where the problem occurs. Okay. So we'll discuss more in the next time.